landmark in the Lowcountry, Burke High School. The origins of this institution trace back to the late 1800s. Construction of the first school completed in 1910, later opening with 375 African American students. The seeds of change in our country have been felt in the Burke High School hallways. 1946, faculty receives pay equal to that of white counterparts. Burke students in the 60s participated in civil rights activism. And flashing forward to just 20 years ago, the construction of a new facility. And tonight, this auditorium hosting Republican candidates for Congress. And now to quickly introduce our candidates this evening. First, Lynn's Piper Loomis, who does not have a background in politics, and she's not been a lobbyist, but she describes herself as an American who cares, a military wife, she is an advocate for veterans and their caregivers. Next, we have Congresswoman Nancy Mace, who is a business owner, and prior to being elected to Congress, she was a member of the South Carolina General Assembly. And last, we have Katie Arrington. Katie describes herself as a pro-Trump conservative with strong family values. She worked for the Department of Defense and Risk Management. She is also a business owner and lives in Somerville. Now to quickly introduce our panelists tonight. Dr. Gibbs Knotts is the Dean of the School of Humanities and School Sciences at the College of Charleston. He teaches undergrad courses in American politics and also serves as a political analyst for ABC News 4. Elizabeth Sad is the district chair of Charleston Peninsula, Charleston County Republican Party, and is a certified South Carolina guardian ad litem. Next, we have Austin Stone. He is the managing partner of Beck and Stone, a brand consultancy seeking to renew American culture. He currently serves as interim COO of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, an organization which works to heal distressed communities through conservative policy. He's been published in Newsweek, Law and Liberty, and The Federalist. And we have Caitlin Forkaway, who is a senior here at Burke, Student Government Association President, school valedictorian and plans to attend Claflin University on a full scholarship. So let's get started. And since we are at Burke High School tonight, we're going to have our student panelists, Caitlin Forkaway, ask the first question tonight, and that will go to candidate Lynn's Piper Loomis. Um, Burke High School, y'all can hear me. <laughs> Burke High School. What do you think about the choice of Burke High School for this debate, and how would you work to earn the votes of all residents in the first congressional district? Great. Um, so I think this is a great location. I think that um, it's awesome to be here. And the way that I would earn the votes in this district would be by endorsing Katie Arrington for South Carolina District 1 for Congress. <laughs> We are again live on television and we need to get all of this in this done in one hour. We do appreciate your enthusiasm tonight though, however. So Caitlin, if you would please, if you don't mind, please uh, repeat your question. Burke High School is a historic high school in the Charleston region and a great location for this debate. What do you think about the choice of Burke High School for this debate and how would you work to earn the votes of all residents in the first congressional district? Thank you, Caitlin. And Lindsay, uh, thanks for stepping into the arena. It takes a lot of courage to take up the mantle and put everything out there and put everything on the line to run for Congress. So we thank you for, for your service in doing that, putting everything out there. Caitlin, uh, that is a fantastic question. Uh, the, for the low country, uh, we sort of march the beat of our own drum. And we care about fiscal conservative values. We want someone who's not going to raise our taxes. 
uh, someone that really looks at the pocketbook of what's happening in Washington. We want someone who's also going to protect the low country. Offshore drilling, for example, was really uh, an important issue to the low country as well. But also, since we were at Historic Burke High School, um, you know, civil rights is an issue that I've worked on for a number of years since, since I was a state lawmaker. And I want to say tonight, I want to thank you for your leadership in student government. I hope that one day in the future, we'll see you here up on this stage uh, running for some office in the future. So it's an honor to be here tonight with everyone this evening. Thank you. So thank you, Caitlin, for the question. And I look forward to seeing you excel in, in whatever you decide to do in your future career. And Ms. Piper Loomis, thank you so very much. I'm honored, I'm grateful, and Ingrid, for you as well, thank you, and for Keith, all endorsing me um, in this campaign. So Burke High School, right, folks? This is the heart of what was SE1, and it's not anymore. Now, this school is actually you know, cemented in, in our, our, our Charleston County community hearts. We love it here. But it also shows how inclusive we are, right? Let's think about this. We had the Emanuel 9 shooting in South Carolina. And our South Carolina senator, Senator Tim Scott, said that we would not be the party, that this town, this community, was about inclusivity and that we love everyone. And we did the Unity Bridge. And I look at Burke High School, and I look at what it means to be unified as a congressional district. And the Republican Party is a broadening tent. And we want to bring everybody inside, no matter race, color, sex, origin. We in the Republican Party, we're the party of people, and we're excited to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our next question will be from Austin, and we'll begin with Katie Harrington. It is widely acknowledged that the cost of health care in this country is ballooning out of control. I myself am a recent cancer survivor who underwent procedures with a total bill of over $1.5 million, far higher than the average family can afford. Is health care a top priority for your campaign, and how would you address it? So number one, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here, sir. And as a cancer survivor myself, I have to say, go to you. Um, right now, health care, yes, it is a priority. But the biggest priorities that I've seen while I've been out knocking doors on this campaign are absolutely skyrocketing inflation. People are worried about putting food on the table and gas in their tank. National security, our border security, our communities. But more importantly, the, most, the, the highest priority, I think, is the indoctrination of our children with CRT and the, the transdemic pandemic that's going on throughout our schools. Now, health care, you know, under Trump administration, we did a great deal on that. I, I, I commend President Trump. I am the, the Trump-endorsed America First candidate. And when I get to Washington, that will be a priority to deal with as a cancer survivor. And if you all might remember, I was in a bad car accident. Um, my bill was about a million dollars as well. And unless you have good health care coverage, that is a problem. But we need to go up to Washington to take care of the crises that are at hand right now. Thank you for being here this evening. And uh, it's an important issue. I mean, years ago, Republicans ran on saying they were going to repeal Obamacare. And then what did they do? They fumbled the ball and they kept it. And we've seen the health care prices skyrocket. I was talking to a small business owner a couple of months ago talking about how his, his insurance premiums have increased. And he pays his premiums for all of his employees, all 20 of them. He's got a small business. And he's not sure with the increases he's having annually every single year that he can afford to continue that on. There's very little competition in the marketplace because of Obamacare. You have the federal government trying to uh, institute price controls, which also hurts the market. You have contracts in place where doctors can't compete because of a mon hospital monopolies. That's more of a state issue. You have something like certificate of need in the state of South Carolina that, that under the Azar report in December of 2018, uh, the administration said we need to repeal certificate of need law so we have more competition in the market. And that way you can provide better quality of care at a lower cost. And so we've really got to focus and do what we're saying we're going to do when it comes to health care costs. Thank you, Representative Mace. Our next question will be starting uh, with you, Representative Mace. The question comes from Elizabeth. Good evening. Thank you both for being here. Do you see a benefit in working with Democrats across the aisle to write and pass legislation that's effective and practical but may not go as far as some Republicans would like? Why or why not? Right. Thank you for your question. It's a great question. We're in a really divided country right now. And I'm someone that has a very conservative record, the, the only conservative up here on stage with a conservative voting record. But I also have a history of reaching across the aisle to get things done. In fact, when I was a state lawmaker, I'm the only one 
who had a bill signed into law, and it was a, a bill uh, modeled after uh, a bill that President Trump signed into law, and uh, Governor McMaster signed it into law two years ago. And so I have a, a record, even as a member of Congress today, where I have now passed 16 bills out of committee as a conservative. In fact, I just passed a bill out of the Oversight Committee, and it was a unanimous vote on oversight. Um, and then I have passed four bills out of the floor of the House, one of which was to serve veterans, providing scholarship funding, for example, for Gold Star families. So it can be done, and I promise when I, when I flip this seat in November of 2020 that I would work hard, and that is exactly what I'm doing, delivering on the promises that I made when I ran in 2020. Can you ask the question again, please? Do you see a benefit in working with Democrats across the aisle to write and pass legislation that's effective and practical but may not go as far as some Republicans would like? Why or why not? I don't know about the rest of you right now, but the left has lost their mind. They're unhinged, and we cannot collaborate with them right now. What Ms. Mace has done Every single opportunity is cozying up co-sponsoring bills with AOC, 40% of the time voting with the Democrats. That is not what we sent her up to Washington to do. We sent Representative Mace because she was Trump endorsed and said she was America first. And the moment that she got up there, she turned her back on us. Then she turned her back on President Trump. And that is not what a conservative does. She has spent her time in Washington working on a liberal agenda because she thought this district she read the room wrong. She thought this district was a moderate district, and we are not. We are conservative. We care about faith, family, and freedom, and that is what I'm going to Washington to do, to ensure that the conservative principles are instituted. The America First agenda is the priority, not the radical left, and siding with AOC and Nancy Pelosi. And Ms. Arrington, this next question will be for you. It's being asked by... Dr. Gibbs Knotts. There's a national shortage of baby formula with out of stock rates expected to hit 40% by the end of May. This shortage is even having life or death consequences with four babies recently being admitted to South Carolina hospitals because of the shortage. How did we get in this situation and what would you do to fix it? First of all, we got into the situation for people like Ms. Mace here who voted to certify the election. We wouldn't be here under Trump's administration. I can tell you that right now. Now, let me tell you, I ran, I ran the supply chain during the pandemic. And I can tell you what you are feeling right now is 100% Biden policies manufactured. This is the Green New Deal being shoved down your throat in any, new, any way they can. Now, when I ran the supply chain during the pandemic, there wasn't a store shelf that was empty. Your gas stations had fuel. You got the medications you need because we knew what we were doing. And in fact, it's sad to say that President Biden, I actually sent out the solution on how to fix this problem that they got us into, manufactured. I sent that in a tweet and said, all you need to do is tell HHS to declare a national health emergency, use an EUA to bring the formula from Europe. But it's sad when we are the leaders of the free world. It is a disgrace to this country that our children are going hungry and that we're having to airlift formula in. This is 100% the effects of the Biden administration and the radical left trying to shove the socialism down your throat. This is a this the baby formula problem is a creation of Joe Biden. It's his own creation. In fact, I, I talked two weeks ago. I was on my flight home from D.C. back to the Low Country, and I had a young mom texting me while I was in the air. I had Wi-Fi and saying that her and some friends, because they couldn't find it on on shelves in grocery stores, they were importing it from Europe, and it was seized by customs. And my and my staff and I, we got it released very quickly, as quickly as we could. Uh, but we're seeing this in the Low Country, we're seeing it across the state of South Carolina, we're seeing it across the country. It's a 43% shortage of baby formula. Two months ago, the Joe Biden's administration and the FDA knew that there was a halt on production by one of the major manufacturers of baby formula. And there are only two or three major ones. It's almost a monopoly. We don't have as much competition in the market as we need to. We have tariffs or taxes that I filed a bill after these moms reached out to me to raise taxes on imports of baby formula, at least temporarily, for the next six 
eight or 10 weeks until U.S. production could ramp back up again. Um, and so when you look at that issue, it's a production issue, it's a supply chain issue, and the FDA, quite frankly, was given over $100 million two months ago to look at supply chain issues, and they simply ignored it, and they had all the tools and resources they needed. So what we need to do is get a Republican majority in 2022 and win back the White House in 24. Thank you, Representative Face. Our next question you will be answering first, mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin. This question is about voting. The Southern Poverty Law Center recently stated, despite gains made over the past several decades, we face a renewed commitment by many in power to take us back to old shameful days of poll taxes, literacy tests, identification cards, and citizenship tests. Do you believe this is true? And what would you do to protect voting rights? Well, I can tell you the state of South Carolina has some of the best election laws and voting laws in the country. And we have State Senator Tom Davis from the Low Country, who's led on several of those election integrity bills. In fact, we just uh, had signed into law early voting as one of those pieces of legislation that Governor McMaster signed into law recently. Um, but I sit on the Election Integrity Caucus in Congress. Um, I'm very concerned about states that don't have uh, signature validation for absentee ballots. I'm worried about the ballot boxes and some of the videos that we've seen out there. We want to ensure that if you're a citizen of this country, that your vote is protected. And, it's, and it's, we need to make sure we have guardrails for states to ensure that the integrity of every election is secure. And I, on Oversight Committee, we, we had a, a hearing on this last year, and we had Democrats from Texas come up, and they had no idea idea what the stats were the support for voter ID laws by Democrats, by African Americans, by women and Hispanics in this country, absolutely clueless. But the vast majority of Americans Time. want to ensure their vote is secure and you have to use an ID to vote. Time. Thank you. So I'll just lead off with this. Um, transparency is everything in government. And if Ms. Mace had just said no and sent this, the election back on, on January 6th to the states to get audited, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. But yet again, it's the power of the people that really matters. And we have the Buford group here today that, that led a, a huge effort in establishing the new laws in South Carolina. Um, it was a grassroots effort from the community. It was you, the, the, the elected, the, the citizens of the Palmetto State that came together and unified. Not only did you prove the hypothesis that, that, that this was a rigged election, you actually wrote legislation and you handed it over to the legislator. We have some of the best um, voter integrity laws because of your efforts, not because of legislators, because of your grassroots efforts. And we are going to take this country back by doing that state by state. Look at what we did in South Carolina. You have to have, you know, on an absentee ballot, the last four digits of your social security number. You have to show voter ID. Arizona, look at what they did. They followed an step. So I can't say enough thank yous to the state of South Carolina legislature and Governor McMasters for passing voter integrity, but more importantly, thank you to the constituents of this district for your hard work. Austin, we'll have our next question of Ms. Arrington starting. Congress recently approved a bipartisan proposal to spend an additional $40 billion to Ukraine, a country with a long record of corruption and money laundering. The bill passed while many Americans are struggling to afford gas and food because of staggering inflation. Do you support this legislation, and how would you balance spending on international affairs versus prioritizing the immediate needs of your constituents? So first of all, the, the reason I'm here is Nancy Mace voted for that bill. And my problem is that money was borrowed from China. Putin and Xi were jumping up and down when we borrowed money from them to, to, to continue on this Ukraine war. We need to take care of home first, America first. That's what my agenda is about. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't feel for the people of Ukraine, and we absolutely do. But remember, in President Trump's administration, he is the one that, that you know, called this out many, many years ago. He told Europe, don't get hooked into Russian oil and gas, and they did. So absolutely, I, I can't in good consciousness, when we have sky-high inflation, 40-year record, gas prices over 450 a gallon, a crisis at the border, and our education system crumbling, validate sending 40 billion borrowed dollars. And Ms. May says that she's a conservative, a fiscal conservative, and she doesn't ever raise taxes. Folks, that bill didn't just raise your taxes, it raised your children's children's children taxes. Right. 
my opponent simply not telling the truth. Uh, I, along with Senator Tim Scott and others in our delegation, voted for this bill. The vast, and there's not a single tax hike in this bill. I have a record of voting to lower taxes 100% of the time. And in fact, when we're talking about Ukraine, the vast majority of this funding went to the U.S. military to resupply our stockpiles, to make sure our troops that are deployed overseas in Eastern Europe have hazard pay, to ensure that the sanctions against Russia are analyzed and overseen, and to ensure that the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine is secure. That is putting America first. And we have a number of military bases. We have one third of all military veterans in the state of South Carolina right here in the 1st Congressional District. I serve on the VA committee and I support our military. I come from a long line of folks who've served our country and I support our veterans. I'm going to use my rebuttal. Ms. Arrington is choosing to use one of her three third-second rebuttals. So fiscal conservative, I too read the bill um, and the $9 billion for our Department of Defense to replenish, I, I don't disagree with that. And the $115 million to replenish our military service men and women, I have no problem with. I do have a problem sending $116 million to the Department of Justice to, you know, go look for Russian oligarchs' yachts. That isn't going to happen. But, you know, Ms. May, she said you're a fiscal conservative and you primaried uh, with Joe Cunningham in the general election. You said one of your primary focuses in the first piece of legislation you would put is the penny, uh, penny sales uh, penny uh, plan, which would take a penny off of every dollar spent, and yet you just filed it three weeks ago. What you been doing? Time. <laughs> Do you choose to rebut it this time? No. Uh, Ms. Arrington, just to remind you, you have two 30-second yep. rebuttals less, uh, left, and uh, Representative Mace, you still have your three on the Thank table. You. Um, our next question will be from Elizabeth and Representative Mace. This will start with you. We're now more than two years into the pandemic. What are your thoughts on employer and school vaccine mandates, mask mandates, school closures, and lockdowns? Thank you. Uh, I, I talked about this a lot during COVID-19. I'm a single working mom. I have two teenage kids who were sent home and went to virtual school during COVID-19. And those, uh, when those kids were sent home, it had a devastating impact on families across the country, particularly families where both parents were working or families that didn't have internet or, or broadband. Uh, I've been against vaccine mandates and, and mass mandates and kids being out of school because we know when kids are in school, they're learning. And when President Joe Biden um, put a mandate on our border patrol, for example, I filed a bill that would not allow those vaccine mandates. He's let millions of illegal immigrants come across our southern border they were unvaccinated, they weren't tested for COVID, um, and weren't, we weren't putting our, our, our needs first with those who sacrifice everything along our border and including our ICE agents. So I find it hard. Um, Ms. Mace went on Fox News one day and said, you know, natural immunity matters um, and that we don't need vaccines. And the same day, Sam Malfin went to CNN and MSNBC and said the exact opposite. Now, I can tell you what I'm going to do going forward. When I go to Washington, the first bill, that we, one of the first bills we're going to put out is that every service member in the U.S. military that was relieved of duty because they refused the jab, we're going to bring them back with back pay and reinstitute them. We are not going to force our children. Under President Trump to serve the COVID pandemic supply chain, shutting down the nation was the, the hardest decision that president ever made. But you know what it was the hardest was how our children suffered. But let's make lemonade out of the lemons that the, the COVID pandemic gave us. It lifted the veil on what's happening to our children in education with CRT, with what they're being indoctrinated in the transgender agenda. So let's do us all a favor, right? Let's just pray to God, our Father, you remember, in God we trust, and pray that nothing like that ever happens again, which it probably will with the Democrats in charge. And let's sure the next time this happens, we don't shut down as a nation. We take the precautions to take care of each other, but we cannot tor torture our children by shutting down for another pandemic, keeping them out of schools, getting educated, time. and enhancing their social skills. Sorry. Okay. Okay. You guys are doing good so far with the Tommy. Thank you Thank so much. You. All right, our next question will come from Gibbs, and Ms. Arrington it will be addressed to you. So as you know, gas prices are pretty high right now. Uh, would you support offshore drilling off the coast of South Carolina to decrease gas prices? Why or why not? So first and foremost, there's no gas, no oil or gas off of the coast of South Carolina. Would I support being energy independent? Did we all enjoy the Trump administration when we were energy independent? In fact, we were energy dominant, and I want to get back there. 
So we know better here in South Carolina. If there was oil off of our coast, there would be rigs. They would have been there a long time ago. But what we need to do is ensure that Joe Biden is stopped with his is holding up and pulling leases and permits on our federal lands, that we're able to harness our own natural resources. But remember, folks, the Biden agenda, this is socialism in a box, the Green New Deal. They are trying to push you to using electric cars, to which the grid cannot support, by the way, and most of us can't afford them anyway. But we need to hold the line, become energy independent again, energy dominant. Therefore, we do not rely on our adversaries for anything. We had that during the Trump administration, and that's why on the Trump endorsed a candidate going up to Washington to have the America First agenda installed. This was a major issue and why we lost the seat to begin with in 2018, because my opponent has flip-flopped a number on a number of issues, this being one of them. Um, I've always been, been against offshore drilling. In fact, the very first bill I ever filed as a state lawmaker, I was four days into office, was a piece of legislation uh, that, that was against drilling off South Carolina's coast. My opponent had the opportunity to co-sponsor that bill and refused to. And if you looked at her comments in 2018 when she flip-flopped, saying that uh, you'd never see the platforms off the coast South Carolina, she was pro-drilling, uh, and then when she won the nomination, she was all of a sudden against drilling. When you flip-flop on issues like that, when you don't have a 100% rating with conservation voters of South Carolina, because conservation is an important issue to residents of the low country, my opponent has scored a 67, which last time I checked was a failing grade, was not passable. Uh, we've got to have someone who's consistent on the issue, but also is thoughtful about our energy independence. Under President Trump, we were net exporters of oil and gas, and now by the end of Joe Biden's second term in office, we are uh, going to be net importers of oil and gas, and that is the wrong direction. Our next question will be for Representative Mace, and will be asked by Caitlin. There is a teacher shortage both nationally and here in South Carolina. Why do we have a teacher shortage, and what can we do to recruit more high-quality teachers to the profession? A great question. My mother is a retired school teacher, and I saw how hard she worked. And when you look at, particularly in South Carolina, where the average amount of money we spend per student or per, per pupil is right in the middle. We're 23rd or 24th in the nation, and yet on our educational outcomes, we're often dead last. And why is that? We have too much money invested in the bureaucracy and not enough going into the classrooms. Our teachers aren't paid enough. Uh, as a state lawmaker, I voted to increase wages for our teachers. It's very important. We need to have different ways to get uh, those who are experts in teaching into the classroom and, and encourage them by, by, by increasing their wages. We also not need to make it so bad that teachers are begging for supplies for their students. We need to make sure that kids have access to Wi-Fi and broadband and the internet, that they have iPads and computers to be able to do their work at school. Um, and those are the kind of, kinds of things, the tools that we need to focus on for our children to be successful. So my baby sister is a doctor of curriculum um, at Philip Simmons High School, and we have very, uh, I would say, uh, energetic conversations about this. Um, so here's what I would say. First and foremost, we need to get the Federal Department of Education uh, disbanded. So that'll be the second piece of the legislation. <laughs> we need to have... The money follow the child, whether it goes into charter school, private school, home school, public school. The teachers know how to teach, and we need to have the federal government get out of their way. The reason why we have a shortage on teachers is because we have them teaching to the test, not teaching to the student. And we need to remember, it is a calling to teach our children. It is a blessing. And we need to have those people, they, you know, m throwing money at this prop isn't the, the issue, right? Everybody would enjoy more pay, no doubt. But the problem is teachers are crying out to get the regulations that the federal government has harnessed them with, especially with CRT, especially with social emotional learning. And we absolutely need to hold the line, get the Federal Department of Education out of our schools, let, let the local and the state legislator and school boards dictate that and teach our children about our U.S. history, Time. unlike the current serving member of Congress who voted with the Democrats to take the, the, the monuments out of the Capitol building. We need to teach the truth to our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, and I think this would be a great time to take a brief break. We'll return with more of Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall debate right after this.
debate. Our candidates here this evening, Representative Nancy Mace and also Katie Arrington. Lynn's Piper Loomis was with us earlier, but she threw her hat into the ring for Katie Arrington. But we will certainly continue on tonight. Uh, we will now begin with Austin. And uh, Ms. Arrington, you will be first to answer Austin's question. Investigative reporter Christopher Rofo has exposed the threat of critical race theory in our schools, our government institutions, and our corporate workplaces. A recent survey from the Heritage Foundation found 63% of Republican voters oppose critical race theory and find it harmful to children. This issue has also been widely debated in South Carolina. What is your stance on critical race theory? Absolutely not on my watch. And I have to say, you know, thanks to groups like Moms for Liberty, who I think are in the audience tonight, who when the pandemic hit, the rally call went out, right? We don't want to tell a child they're less than for any reason under the sun. We, we should be promoting our children and telling them they can reach any goal, not because the color of your skin you can't achieve something. That is crazy. But yet again, this goes to why we need the Federal Department of, Immig the Federal Department of Education disbanded. We need to have the federal government out of our schools. Our founding fathers never wanted it. And critical race theory is not new, folks. You remember, who started the Department of Federal Education? President Jimmy Carter, a Democrat. Now think about that. Bloated government teaching our children that they're, because of their, their color of their skin or their gender, that they have something wrong with them. We need to empower our children. We need to get the government out of their school lives. We need to bring God back to school. The only thing I would ever ask of the Federal Department of Education is A, to ensure every morning those kids say the Pledge of Allegiance, and then they get 30 seconds to say a prayer. I've sponsored legislation to ban critical race theory being taught to our military soldiers. I've sponsored legislation to prohibit it from being taught in our schools. And on the oversight committee, just a few weeks ago, we had a hearing about the curriculum that's being taught in our schools. And Democrats had three witnesses that were there that day, a librarian, an activist, and a teacher. And I asked them, should state superintendents of education have a say in our kids' education and in curriculum? Not a single one of them could answer the question, yes or no. I then asked if school board should have a say in our students' education and curriculum. Not a single one of them could answer the question. I then asked, should parents have a say in the curriculum in our kids' education? Yes or no? And they could not answer the question. This is what we are up against, which is why it is so important that we have a Republican majority in 2022. And that majority runs right through the first congressional district. And I've won this seat before. I beat a Democrat in 2020. And I will keep this seat in Republican hands in November. Our next question will be for Representative Mace. Uh, it will be from Elizabeth. With the prospect of Roe v. Wade being overturned by the US Supreme Court and the matter being back in the hands of the states, what limitations, if any, would you like to see South Carolina impose on abortion and why? Um, right. Well, uh, one of the things I'm really concerned about with Roe v. Wade are uh, what's going on with our Supreme Court justices. You had someone leak this document, this draft opinion, that will come out sometime this summer, and uh, they're protesting at the justices' homes, they're threatening their lives, and it's completely un-American. And we have a president, Joe Biden, and his lackeys who are endorsing this idea that you should and can go and protest at Supreme Court justices' houses, which, by the way, according to the U.S. Code of Laws, is against the rule of law. When it comes to Roe v. Wade uh, and, and pro-life, I have a record of voting pro-life 100% of the time. I have an A-plus rating with the Susan B. Anthony uh, Lesson organization, and I'm very proud of the pro-life record that I have today. So first and foremost, I'm the only uh, candidate on the stage that can say they're 100% pro-life, no exceptions. Um, I am a devout Catholic who believes that life started at conception and God does not make mistakes. And we need to bring back this country from thinking that it's okay to do this. 
Um, but it does go to the radical left, right? They, they destroyed the, the executive branch with the elections that Ms. May certified in 2020. Um, you, as Ms. Mace, you know, has taken more money from PACs than, than I don't even know and has bought and paid for by the swamp and has destroyed the legislative branch. That's why you need to send me a servant leader to Washington who's going to serve this community, not worry about getting on TV and, and, and making her own brand. Um, but what happened with Roe v. Wade? Ruth Bader Ginsburg said it best. It was always a state's right issue. The fact that this is now back, you know, in play and needs to come to the state of South Carolina. You know, I too was endorsed by Susan B. Anthony Foundation when I was a state house representative, which um, I was very proud of. I've always been incredibly pro-life. But thankfully, in the state of South Carolina, we have the heartbeat bill. I don't know that that goes far enough, but it's a state decision. And I'm glad to see that the state of South Carolina, Governor McMaster, a Republican-held uh, House and Senate passed that this year, and very proud of that. But it is a state's right issue. It never was, should have been at the federal government. Our next question, Ms. Harrington, we'll start with you. Uh, that question will come from Gibbs. Earlier this month, there was a shooting next to a baseball field in the Pepper Hill community located in North Charleston. Unfortunately, these acts of random violence appear to be increasingly common. What would you do to decrease these types of shootings in our communities? So, first of all, you know, I would say that the radical left and, you know, making violence uh, okay um, through the summer of violence, uh, you know, as we w watched all the riots and, and people, you know, accosting each other with, with no replications, no, no, no problem, you can do that. Um, but we have great laws on the books, uh, but because of the Biden administration, because of the defund the police, we don't have the law enforcement to enforce them. Um, you shouldn't, you know, gun enforcement, the reason our founding fathers gave us the Second Amendment is to protect us from a government, right? But legal law-abiding citizen gun owners aren't walking around shooting people. That's not the case. And I'm a strong proponent of the Second Amendment and, and come and try and take my gun. But what I would say on when it comes to, <laughs> try, um, but when it comes to issues like the violence that we're seeing, right, when you say it's okay to murder a baby in the womb, what's the difference of murdering a baby in the womb versus murdering somebody outside on the, of the street? We have a, 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 I would say, a moral crisis going on in this country, more importantly than anything, and that life is, is sanctity, it is everything, and that we need every human life matters. And it doesn't matter if it's a child playing on the schoolyard, or it's a child in the womb, or it's a 70 year old person walking uh, to, to get food at the grocery store. Every human life matters, Time. and we need to do our most to support and protect them. Unfortunately, the Low Country is no stranger to some of these kinds of shootings. On April 26th, as the shooting you mentioned, there were over 30 shots fired. And watching the horror of that video to see young kids crawling off the baseball field uh, at, at night when they were at their game with their families is devastating to watch. I've worked on a number of these issues. In fact, it was just last week where we unveiled the active shooter alert bill. Uh, like the Amber Alert, it would alert, alert folks in the community when there is a shooting. But unfortunately, the Low Country is home to not just that shooting. I mean, almost seven years ago in June, we'll have the anniversary of Mother Emanuel, and we've got to do more work. Over the last two years, we've seen more violence in this country than ever before. And during COVID-19, that violence has only increased in cities across the country, including cities right here in the Low Country. Our police, our law enforcement, our first responders have the most dangerous job in America right now. And rather than defund the police like the far left and the Cory Bushes of the world, the squad and the AOCs want to do, we need to fund them to the best of our ability so that they are safe on the streets, keeping every community, no matter your zip code or color of your skin, keeping you safe at home. Our next question, Representative Mace, we'll start with you. We'd like to remind you both that uh, Ms. Arrington, you still have two rebuttals. And Representative Mace, you still have your three on the table. Our next question will be coming from Caitlin, and we'll start with Representative Mace again. As a member of Congress, you will represent a diverse population. How will you connect with the various minority groups in your district? I actually have been working on a number of different issues over the years, starting from when I was a state lawmaker and now as a member of Congress. 
we want to be a big tent party. We want to show that our conservative values are the best values for the country. And you see how much damage Joe Biden has done. When we talk about things and we lower the temperature and we show how much passion and compassion we have for different communities across the country, we can win more people over and we've got to. Joe Biden has done more damage in the first six months of his administration than I thought possible in four years. And that was before the illegal immigration crisis at the southern border. That was before Afghanistan. And that was before record inflation, which, by the way, is double digits over the last 90 days at 10 percent. But our values uh, protect the greatest freedom, the freest, uh, most democratic country in the world. And when we prosper, everybody prospers, regardless of, of the color of your skin, your zip code, where you come from. Uh, the American dream is alive and well here. I, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I can barely hear. I, okay. I'm sorry, Caitlin. A member, as a member of Congress, you will represent a diverse population. How will you connect with the various minority groups in your district? So we've been doing that on the ground in this, this congressional effort from day one. Um, you know, I, when Ingrid Centurion um, dropped out of the race to support me, a uh, huge influencer in the Latino community, and I will say uh, Linda Cotton, she's not here today, but you know, we met her today, I, I have, I've been working with her, to broaden the tent, right? Republican is the party of the people. It is not determined by someone's you know, race or, or their sex. It's about being an American. And I look at the people across the district, especially down in Beaufort, where we have some amazing diversity happening. You know, we have Senator Tim Scott in the north part of the district, and then you look in the southern part, you know, Willie Terrell, head of the, the, the Beaufort Young Republicans. You know, he is a black young man who's put himself through school. He's, he's you know, he jokes around that he is one of uh, three people to vote on St. Helena Island. And he's the only one who ever votes Republican. We need to do more to open and broaden our tent and understand that we are the party of the people. We will always give our brothers and sisters a hand up, but we won't give them a hand out as Republicans because the, the entitlements that the Democrats have enticed the minorities in, they're not sustainable and they don't help them. They actually oppress them. So we as the Republican Party need to show how good we really are, how it makes someone feel to own a home, how good it makes someone feel to have their own job or own their own business. And we need to, to do more to cultivate that in the Republican Party. And I hope to do that as a member of Congress, Time. working with the local district and, and the, de the people already on the ground. Thank you. Our next question will be from Austin. Ms. Arrington, it will be your turn. Americans are facing a new housing bubble with skyrocketing prices, soaring rents, increasing mortgage interest rates, and a lopsided seller's market. What would you do to solve the current housing crisis? So the housing crisis is, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, it's like the Carter administration part two. I mean, I remember uh, being a kid and our parents couldn't afford to buy a house because the mortgage rates were 18%. Now, my husband happens to be a land surveyor, and we see you know, all of these new houses going and the bloated you know, elevation of costs. Um, we have to get this down, but this is a part of the, once again, the, the Biden policies, right? They're, they're giving money away. People are, are spending like there's no tomorrow because there's no fiscal conservative in, in Washington right now. And what's happening in inflation, what you're seeing is, you know, as our house prices go up, gas prices go up, food prices go up, what's going to end up happening? The same thing that happened in 2008, the same thing that happened in the Carter administration, right? The bottom's going to fall out. And we need to send people to Washington who actually are going to do something about it. When they say that they're going to cut the budget, really mean cut the budget. So I'm going to Washington as the America First candidate to hope that we can get the Convention of States to have zero-based budgeting so that we can get this under control. Inflation is a massive crisis. Over the last 90 days, inflation has averaged almost 10%. Uh, when you look at the housing bubble and look at the price of everything, here in the low country, the cost to rent or buy a home has gone up over 25%. And when the cost of goods go up, the cost of housing, everything becomes more unaffordable. Um, I am the only fiscal conservative up here on this stage tonight. I'm the only candidate in this race who has a record of voting to lower taxes 100% of the time. In fact, in 2019, I received the Taxpayer Hero Award from the very conservative South Carolina Club for Growth. And very recently, I filed the Penny Plan, something I talked a lot about in order to balance the budget. I mean, when COVID happened, the government literally shut businesses down, and yet the federal government still continued to, re to include and get historic revenues. But if you do the Penny Plan, and Rand Paul has a Senate version, I have the companion bill in the House, but if you take away five cents of every future dollar that the federal government spends, it used to be 
one penny, but because of the deficit spending, it's higher now. But you'd be able to balance the budget in five years and increase spending over 10% every year thereafter. But we've got to get smart about it. And it's Republicans and Democrats that have been at fault, that have raised taxes and have spent our kids and our grandkids' futures away. So I'm, I'm going to do a rebuttal. Okay. Ms. Arrington has chosen, please. Ms. Arrington has chosen to use her second rebuttal. You'll have 30 seconds. So I, I'm still struggling to understand the penny plan bill, which is not a bad idea, why it took a, until I entered the race to file that bill. Um, secondarily, um, some of the bills that you have written, Ms. Mace, you say you're fiscal conservative. Explain to the audience why you think with, with Democrats that we should spend 10 million taxpayer dollars to study whether pigs should lay down or stand up while they're giving birth. <laughs> I, I'm, and I'm not, and please explain to us as a fiscal conservative Time. why you would put legislation out to protect baby panda bears. Time. Time. Would you like to rebuttal? Uh, yeah, I think, I think I will. President okay. Trump was one of the greatest presidents of all time protecting animal rights. And I've done, he's, he's signed several bills into law, thank you. But when we're talking about this issue in spending, I'm the only candidate up here who has a record of voting to lower taxes 100% of the time. It was my opponent who voted for the ta highest tax hike in South Carolina history, and that would be the gas tax. She voted with Democrats for that hike. And in, when Governor Henry McMaster vetoed the tax hike because he didn't agree with it. It was my opponent the same day and in the press said she was, quote, saddened by his veto. And so she then went and voted with Democrats to overrule his veto. And when that gas, t gas tax kicks Time. in finally this summer, when you say and blame Joe Biden, he did that, you can say Katie Arrington helped him. Yeah. We have five minutes left. Representative Mace's next question will be for you from Elizabeth. South Carolina's infrastructure is in pretty rough shape. Roads are filled with potholes. Many of our bridges are structurally deficient. What would you do to fix South Carolina's deteriorating infrastructure? Uh, I sit on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee in Congress. And when we did the infrastructure bill, we were told it was going to be paid for. I actually had $1.2 billion for the low country in that bill. And then it was stripped out in the Senate. And come to find out, it wasn't paid for it. It was $256 billion in deficit spending. It included 42 new taxes. If it were up to me, and it's not because we have to have consensus in Congress to pass anything out of both chambers, I would have allowed our states who had all this excess trillions of dollars, $2 trillion actually, to be left over in their COVID relief funding and allow them to make the decision on what they wanted to do for their infrastructure. Just last week on the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we had markup on the Water Resource Development Act. I have more than five projects funded in that bill. It was a unanimous vote, and it does not include any, we're not raising any taxes, we're using money from old projects that, that have not been spent, and we've got, we've been working very hard, but it's over $50 million in infrastructure funding for water projects, floods, stormwater management, uh, and on. So the difference between Ms. Mace and myself is she is a politician and she is telling you what you want to hear and I'm a servant leader problem solver. And when I went into the state of South Carolina and we did the gas tax, we actually wrote it so that the, the residents of South Carolina would be rebated on their income tax and, and I'm, I'm proud of that. But we also have two big drivers of our economy tourism and the ports. And it would be hard pressed for any one of us to say that our roads are getting destroyed by that if we don't have them helping to pay for it as they're going across our, our driving our roads. So I, I solved the problem. So over 607 miles have been resurfaced in our district alone. Over 50 bridges because of that money have been repaired just since it went into effect. So I'm not going to tell you about how the problems are, uh, you know, what, what the problems are in Washington. I'm a problem solver. I'm a servant leader. I don't whine about problems, right? I solve them. Our next question, Ms. Arrington, this will be, uh, we will start with you, Gibbs. Why are you the best person to beat Annie Andrews uh, in November? So that's an easy one. So my platform is that of the conservatives, faith, 
family, and freedom. I'm going up as a Trump-endorsed America First candidate in the South Carolina District 1 to represent as a servant leader. My platform is not about legalizing recreational drugs. My platform is not about saving baby pandas. In fact, my opponent had the audacity to go to Forbes magazine and say, in January 2022, what you cared most about in the district was Britney Spears' conservatorship, cannabis, right, and pets. And that, to me, is, is a Democrat, right? She has voted and sponsored bills, over 100 bills with Democrats. She's actually co-sponsored with AOC. So her platform with, is, is almost a Democrat's platform, I would argue. You can say you're a fiscal conservative, but when you act like a liberal, you're a rhino. And that is not what we need in this district. We need somebody who's going to go to Washington and be a hard enforcer of the America First agenda to hold the line. My opponent lost his seat in 2018 in the midterm election to a Democrat for the first time in 40 years. She didn't understand low country values. She didn't understand what it took that this district marches to the beat of its own drum. And I, when I ran in 2020, I promised to be a fiscal conservative. I had a 98, almost perfect score with, the, with uh, the South Carolina Club for Growth the same year my opponent scored a 30. Voting with Democrats 70% of the time. I'm the only candidate up here who knows how to beat a Democrat in this day and age in this district. And I promised that I would work hard, I promised to be an independent voice, and I promised not to tow the party line when they taxed too much and spent too much in this country. And I know how to keep this seat Republican because I won this seat back for Republicans in November of 2020. And come hell or high water, I'm going to keep this seat in Republican hands in November. Can I use my last yeah. rebuttal? Please, we are short on time. Please hold your applause. We are getting close to the end. Ms. Arrington, would you like to use your last rebuttal? I will use my last Go rebuttal. Go ahead. Ms. Mace, with all due respect, because I do respect you as a, as a mother and as our arc sitting congresswoman. But you won this seat because Tr President Donald J. Trump endorsed you to go to be the America First candidate. And we need to hold the line. So I, I appreciate that, that you, know, you think that playing to the moderate base and, and, and playing to the left is going to win this seat. It is absolutely not. We want the America First agenda. We miss being energy independent. We want that back, and we are not willing to sacrifice that so that you can have time on Fox News and CNNN. We want to have this district represented by somebody who understands the interests of this district time. and are going to go to Washington and enforce them. Time. I don't you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. I'm in this seat because my opponent lost it to a Democrat for the first time in 40 years. I'm the only, I am the only conservative. I am conservative before I am Republican and I have the record to back it up. I had a 98 with the very conservative South Carolina Club for Growth the same year my opponent scored a 30. That is not conservative. My opponent voted for the highest tax hike in South Carolina history. I have a record of voting to lower taxes 100% of the time. My opponent simply can't tell the truth, and maybe it's because she just can't handle the facts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that does it for our questions from our panelists tonight. Uh, we will now have one minute closing statements from each. And we will begin with Nancy Mace, Representative Mace. Thank you. It is the honor of my lifetime to serve the Low Country. I never thought in a million years that this is where I would be. When I was 17, I dropped out of high school. I learned some really tough lessons during some really tough times. But during that time in my life, I learned about the value of hard work. It was my parents, my father, retired Army general, and my mother, a retired school teacher, who told me if you're going to quit going to school, you got to start going to work. And I took a job as a waitress at a Waffle House on College Park Road in Latson, exit 203 off of I-26 when you're coming in to Charleston. I eventually would graduate from the Citadel, my home turf right next door to Burke High School. I'd start my own company in 2008, and today I'm a sitting member of Congress. My life has been a series of second chances, but I got here because I worked hard. And when I won this seat, when my opponent couldn't in 2020, it's because I promised to work hard for the low country. 
and my record speaks for itself, and I'm very proud of that record. There have been many statements that have been said tonight that are just not true. I can be trusted to keep your taxes low, and I can be trusted with our nation's secrets. I wasn't the one that had my top secret security clearance suspended for leaking classified information about our military. And it was our Time. military. Time. When my opponent Time. did this, that Time. said her leak of classified Time. information put our national security Time. in grave danger. Time. Their words, not mine. Representative Face, Time, thank you. Ms. Arrington, your closing statements, please. So One minute. That, ladies and gentlemen, just shows you how low Nancy Mace will go to completely no, join the swamp. I was a victim of a political hit job, point blank. I proudly serve my nation. I, I, everything she said is a lie, and I have proven it time and time again. But so, I've got the receipts. But, so, ladies and gentlemen, what I am going to Washington to do is to be a servant leader. I am the Trump-endorsed, America First candidate. I am going to be a servant leader, to donate my salary to charity, to not take congressional retirement or benefits, and to term limit myself Please. so that I can Sir. make sure that I enforce the America First agenda. I am not going up there to pander to the left. I am not going to be a part of the D.C. swamp. I am not going to be bought and paid for. I'm going to serve you. Make your needs the priority, because the, the, there is no time to waste, ladies and gentlemen. And we in the Low Country crave the America First agenda. And I hope and I gratefully ask for your support on June 14th. Thank you to everyone this evening for putting this amazing meeting on. And God bless you and safe travel. That does it for Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall debate tonight. Thank you to our candidates, Representative Mace, Katie Harrington, and also to our panelists tonight, you watching at home and our very spirited audience. God bless. Good night.